This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Over the decades of Benjamin's 72-year-long life, he has given hundreds of lectures about deep cooperation and ran a UN empowerment organization. The amazing thing is this, whether he is talking to a prime minister about his peace plan or to someone who heard one of his more general lectures, almost everyone says that they would prefer living in the type of more cooperative, peaceful, and compassionate world he is describing. Nonetheless, the same people who personally like the picture Benjamin paints use examples of bad behavior by others to prove that most people could not live in a more utopian world. But just as they cite your imperfect behavior as proof that human nature is incompatible with the form of universal love promoted by Jesus, Buddha, and others, you probably see their imperfect behavior as proof that paradise is an overly idealistic dream. As Jesus alluded to and his decades of feedback and study confirm, we all don't live up to our own preferred form of behavior, primarily because we fear that we will be exploited if we trust others and are too kind to them. Decades of study, feedback, and visions dreams convinces him that the hard part is taking a few comparatively easy steps in the right direction to prove to everyone that almost all of us would join a bandwagon for a better world if a critical mass of pathfinders showed how it could be done. Not only does Benjamin's book show how religious and secular evidence jointly indicate that gradually upgrading our behavior is an appropriate adaptation to postmodern circumstances, but it offers a carefully calibrated plan to gradually create a much better world. Benjamin has a message of hope in a world spinning out of control. Valeria interviews Benjamin Freeman. He is the author of Becoming Angels in Paradise, a how-to book. Even as a teenager, Benjamin Freeman wondered why humanity did not use the power of modern technology to create a world of universal abundance rooted in a more compassionate, nurturing, and cooperative interactive pattern. In addition to spending umpteen hours investigating what others have said and done to help humanity move in this direction for over 50 years, I received feedback from myriad people when Benjamin spoke semi-professionally about how to create a more cooperative world. While he primarily made his living from owning a marketing firm and from developing low-income housing, Benjamin ran a UN reform organization when that issue was discussed seriously in New York. Since the organizational purpose was to motivate governments to upgrade UN reform talks to UN empowerment talks, the feedback Benjamin received from thousands of diplomats, politicians, and their aides from every nation made it possible for him to envision a specific plan to end war founded in geopolitical reality. Benjamin also read all major holy books and writings about secular findings in a whole variety of fields, which overlap his key themes. Based on a lifetime of work, finding the common denominators of all these bodies of evidence and dreams about these and related matters. Benjamin has written Becoming Angels in Paradise. Benjamin has one daughter and two grandchildren. He has also traveled very extensively. Meet Benjamin at benjaminfreeman.carrd.co. Here's the interview with Benjamin Freeman. In your own words, who is Benjamin Freeman? Well, I'm not that different from other human beings. <laughs> the only difference is that through decades of study and visions and dreams and meditation, I feel that I've connected with some deeper 
ideas that are founded in the divine, but also in modern secular knowledge. And because of those ideas, which I've become connected with through really most of my life, I feel that I focus on the greater good, mm -hmm. the long-term greater good, yeah. to a greater extent than most people. And in that way, I've dealt with some sort of wisdom, but it's not something that anyone else couldn't do. If you listen to your heart and your soul, we all have within us the possibility of, well, lovingly serving the greater good, which is what I hope the human race should start doing. Yes, yes, a billion times to that truth. Yes. So listening to one's own heart and soul, going deeper, it has been my mission to just listen deeper and deeper. What's the message? And I keep getting that message back since I was very little. Love, 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 in a sense of being kind, of showing compassion, even when I didn't understand what those terms and concepts meant. So the next question to ask you, Benjamin, is about your book. So you wrote a book titled Becoming Angels in Paradise, a how-to book. So talk to me about the main intention and the purpose of writing your book and a bit about the book as well. Well, the truth is, and the Bible sort of says this, that angels are really just homo sapiens who are more aware to the very things you and I are discussing. All humans have the potential to become angels. Now, there are a class of my Bible, my book gets into based on various religious texts, including Greek and Roman mythology. There is a class of Homo sapiens who are a little different than us biologically, who were created directly through divine intervention. And they're what you would normally call angels, but we all could become like them. And that's the real point of my books, that all of us, once we develop a way of loving each other, which includes legal and political changes and includes changes in our behavior, changes in our connection with our heart, changes in our social mores. We would develop a paradise, and as we develop that paradise, we would become like angels. And so that's the point of the book. We could all become angels living in paradise. But it's something that, it, in, I think where I disagree with a lot of people that you might have interviewed is, I don't think an individual can go all the way on their own. I think this is a cooperative effort. We have to co-create a better world. And as we do that, that will help each of us as individuals change. And this is the difficult part. It's not that other people don't like it. I've spoken before groups all over the world about cooperation. And as I discussed with you before the interview, I created a peace plan, which is really about nations cooperating, that I discussed with heads of state. And whether I'm speaking to an individual, to a group, about my general ideas or people about my peace plan, the basic thing most people say is, you know, I would like to live that way. My heart tells me I'd like to live that way, but I don't think other people would. And here's the key answer to that most important question. The key answer is, you judge that you would like to live that way because you can look into your heart. You can feel your own soul, and you know that's what you prefer. But when you judge whether other people are going to live that way, you're judging them by their behavior, because that's all you have to judge them by. And judged by behavior, almost all of us are imperfect. Even people we call saints aren't perfect. And, you know, we all have to react to the world we live in, and we live in an imperfect world, and people protect themselves. So if you look at their behavior, and that includes your behavior, if you look at your behavior, not your heart, you would find ways that you're not truly loving, or maybe you think you are, but other people don't. But I think what people think about themselves is more true, because it's only with yourself 
that you can know what your heart and soul thinks. And everybody within their heart and soul has that. And if we all realize that, then we begin to take gradual steps toward creating a paradise where we would all be angels. Yes, that sounds like a wonderful proposal. <laughs> of course, we all want that. You, you actually mentioned that too, that we all want peace, but it's making it happen that is a challenge. In my view, because of all the studies that I have done too, in my own work of going within, it really shows the main issue being the belief that we are only body and mind, that we are um, only flesh and content of the mind, that we are humans, merely humans that walk on, on this earth, fragile, we could die at any moment, which it is true, the body could be lost at any moment. But there's this fear, there's so much fear attached to the belief that we are the body and mind only. And I think that's the main issue from my perspective. That's a very good point. And after many years of study, in this case, what I've studied is I've read modern scientific treatises on how the brain works. I think what's really going on is there are two parts of what we'll call the brain or mind. We have an animal brain, which is physically hardwired into our body through the nervous system and which is the same as, well, maybe more advanced, but the same in theory as all animals. And that part will eventually die with our body. But we also have a soul. And the soul isn't separate because in our mind, which is a little different than our brain, the soul's thoughts and the brain's thoughts intermingle. And in the mind, we all have the potential to be God. Jesus said, mm, with my yeah. mind, I serve the mm. law of God. With my body, I serve the law of sin. It is absolutely true that our bodies and our animal brain follows that, forces us to do what serves ourself, serves our own short-term needs. And it just does it almost automatically. But our mind often overrules it. And that's where love comes from. I'm talking about normal love, like, let's say, the way people normally think of a man and a woman loving each other, but also all other kinds of love. That our soul's influence on our brain through our common mind makes us feel a desire to love and to enjoy it. And of course, that can be expanded. The most interesting teaching to me of the most revered prophets, which would be Jesus, Buddha, and Mo Tzu, I know you've never heard of him, but there's a reason, was that the answer is something called universal love. We all have love, except the sickest of us, for close people, lovers, you know, husband, wives, children, sometimes our best friends. But the hard part is feeling that love for all beings. And if you let your soul, your mind, be in more control, and you get rid of the fear you're talking about, yes, Roosevelt was correct. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear is the big impediment. There's no question about that. And, and you weaken the fear, then you can begin to develop a connection, a form of love with all beings. Now, that doesn't mean that every human in the world you'll feel the same way toward on a daily basis as you do with your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife or your children. But it does mean you'll feel a more diluted sense of it, what Christians call agape love and what Buddha called compassion. But by compassion, he means something stronger than the normal means. His idea of compassion was almost like love, but it's a little different in the sense it's not as immediate. I mean, obviously, for somebody in China, you don't feel an immediate personal sense of love, but you can care about what happens to them. You can have empathy for what happened to them. And when that starts to 
affect your behavior and you've developed universal love. Mm. Yes. Does that make sense to you? Yes, very much. Yeah. I have a lot of uh, conversations here about that. Yeah. The spiritual mind and universal love. Yes. First, we have to deal with personal, right? Everything seems so personal when we are going deeper within, in a sense, even healing, finding healing. I have a lot of discussions here on healing, healing the body, the mind and all that. So, and then it feels to me exactly that way, that we have to go into personal, trying to explore, investigate, to know what's blocking us to love ourselves even first. And then something happens. It has been my experience. And then there's love, this connection with the natural world and everything that, that's in it, it kind of changes and becomes much more wholesome. And I would say almost has that feeling of wholeness, of freedom itself. For some reason, I do connect universal love to freedom, even in the sense of whatever is happening, is, it's part of that freedom. It's exercising freedom because love, universal love is all inclusive. It's not trying to pick one thing over another. So I would love to hear from you about that, Benjamin, the idea of universal love and freedom itself. Well, I could talk about that, but I want to talk about something you talked about. Yeah. I think that Socrates, the great, supposedly one of the first great philosophers, said, know thyself. And if you want to be honest, when mm. I was younger, I used to see that as not as advanced as universal love. But I now realize that for almost everyone, maybe I was different, but for most people, universal love does start with knowing yourself and loving yourself. And then you expand it outward to those close to you. And then you expand it outward to the whole world, to all beings. And I think they're connected. I, I feel I was a little wrong when I was young. I was, from a youth, always focused on the big <laughs> global yes. issues. Yes. And I realize now the big global issues are important, but they flow from individual issues. If I may relate this, if this isn't too controversial, to current politics. You know, if you hear, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I guess is you're a Democrat. If you hear Republicans talk, particularly with Trump, they have logic behind their ideas. The Democrats have logic behind their ideas. But in the end, something Obama said really says it, that if you're looking at things from a fear-based perspective, you can look at, you know, everyone outside your in-group as being bad. You can look to divide the world into me versus you, us versus them, you know, and and... To a certain extent, Republican politics comes from that, particularly now with Trump. Mm, yes. And yet Democrats are trying to think the other way. That doesn't mean Democrats are right about <laughs> all the issues. <laughs> it, me yes. it means yes. that the perspective people has colors their political view. And you have to start with a perspective, as you said, that lowers fear. And then it'll be easier to develop political ideas that are based on making the whole world better. That doesn't mean you don't have to realize there are problems with just being idealistic, but, you know, you, it depends on your perspective which way you move. And fear is a big problem. And one is a big problem. It's easier if you're not desperate, you know, to survive, if you have enough to see the big picture. Of course, it's not as simple as that because the more you have, the greedier you sometimes become. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. gets worse. Mm -hmm. So well, it's, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> yes. But in the end, <laughs> you have to lower fear lower mistrust, mm. just enough. And that's where my idea of a carefully calibrated plan to correct this problem comes in. Yes, this plan. We have to do it little by little. We can't jump all the way because if you jump too far, 
there will be a negative reaction. But somehow the human race has to gradually move forward little by little. And the first thing we have to think of, which connects politics with personal, which is working cooperatively for mutually advantageous gains is an enlightened form of selfishness in our interdependent post-atomic era. And the ending is important because from having discussed this with people over the world at different levels, what people say is, what you say sounds logical, but why hasn't anyone ever done it before? And my answer to that is that pre-modern circumstances were different. In 1600, most people were self-sufficient farmers and they just dealt with their own family and maybe a little bit of trading. But there was a thin veneer of the upper elite who benefit from exploiting the poor or most people, and then a group of other people who may not have been the upper elite, but they found ways to be criminal and exploit the people. And even though it was wrong then, the logic of it was that because the world was simpler and people were not interdependent, they produced their own goods, and wars couldn't have destroyed civilizations, there was a certain logic behind that, even though it was not moral even then. But today, we're hurting ourselves by being too predatory. Everybody loses. And we see where we're going. If I'm going to tell you a personal story yes. to end this little dissertation. Yes, of course. My, my sister always, she was like me, but she always wondered, oh, Ben, you're so crazy. And she died of leukemia two years ago. And the last thing she said to me before she died of substance was, you know, all your life, I thought you were crazy to think we we're heading to a catastrophe and we had to make radical changes to avoid it. And now that I see what's happened, you know, in the last years since you were a teenager and started telling people that, I realize you were right. And how this relates to the point of why now is the moment is that it's more and more obvious to everybody that things are spinning out of control. Now, people have different arguments about why it's spinning out of control. But if you generally ask the question, is the world spinning out of control? The vast majority of people in the world who answered it would say yes. And now that it is, the answer is we all have to realize it's spinning out of control because everybody, not everybody, but the vast majority of people pursue short-term partisan gain instead of working cooperatively for mutually advantageous gains. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Another billion yeses to that. Absolutely. Yes, Ben. Yeah. That is very much resonates with the heart and with my brain, <laughs> my human brain. Yes. What's not to love about your solution? the ideas you have. The back cover of your book has all these beautiful concepts, compassion, generosity, understanding, kindness, equanimity, nonviolence, tolerance, humility, cooperation, developing wisdom, lessened materialism. So that caught my attention immediately. Ah, less than materialism. <laughs> yes. As you see by looking at the back, but, you know, your listeners aren't looking at the back of my book. I have pictures of Jesus, Buddha, and yes. leading Eastern sages besides Buddha. And I would have Muhammad, except you're not supposed to put Muhammad in a picture, to make the point that this is the basic message of all the holy books. You can summarize the behavioral teachings of every major holy book in one sentence, give more, take less, and lovingly serve the greater good. And when God taught it, it would have been better in the past to do it. But the real point, since you're reading the back of my book, is that I talk in black letters above that. The book shows how modern technology and knowledge allows us to become angels in paradise by adopting all these ideas. And that gets back to what I said in the last answer. Yes, these ideas were good when Jesus spoke them, when Buddha spoke them. 
But Jesus is only preparing us for the close of the age, which is now, the close of the age of oppression. Because now is when, if we don't do this, we're going to destroy the world. And that's the motivation that will allow all people to change once we're aware of what our real choices are. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yes, yes. So it's interesting to see that you went back to spiritual concepts, spiritual messages to to prove a point. (laughs) Yes, I have been on the path for a very long time, which is spirituality has been informing, guiding me, those principles. So easy said than done, of course, in in the world we live in. As you said clearly before, the the mind gets mixed with the thoughts from the brain, you know, the, the survival mechanism, and then it becomes very confusing and fear sets in. So it goes back to the main problem. As long as we believe that we are the body and the brain only, the thoughts coming from the brain, fear-based, then the problem will still continue. It, it can't really end unless we go deeper into what we are, not just who we are, but what. In my, from my perspective, and let's say ways of seeing this reality, it's really that spiritual realm in a sense of being a lot more than just the body mind and let even letting the body mind go if i have to to embrace you know that part of me that i know it never dies that's always here and all, always will be so maybe that's why i talked to you earlier i mentioned freedom the idea of universal love and freedom so i would love for you to touch on that what is your idea of freedom okay i didn't answer your question yeah Freedom is a very interesting question in the context of the United States. You know, obviously, people should, in theory, be free to do whatever they want. And in paradise, that would actually be true. There would be Mm -hmm. no need for any laws, anything like that, because people who, who serve the greater good would naturally only do things that are good. But in our world, where there is so much negativity, There is a need for laws, and the laws do restrict freedom. But I think the way to look at it is people should be free to do whatever either serves the greater good or doesn't harm the greater good. But the law does have to exist, and we should internalize the law and our morality, not to do anything that clearly hurts others more than it helps ourselves. Obviously, no one's going to do anything that they don't think is going to help themselves. But even if something helps yourself, if it hurts others more than it helps yourself, then it should be illegal. And I have a rule about that in my book, if you read it, called the primary actor rule. If you're unclear whether, say, you and I are having an argument or a discussion about what to do, the person who should give in is the person who isn't primarily affected. To use the most obvious example in the world, if I'm mad at you and I'm about to beat you up or shoot you, you could point out that you're the one who would actually be affected more if I hurt you than I would be, because it wouldn't be that big a deal to me that I hurt you, it would be a big deal to you. So my point is, because you'd be hurt or killed. My point is the primary actor rule when there are disagreements, is a basic way to decide how to resolve them. Who's the person that's going to be hurt more? And what it really is about is the greater good. If, if, if you know, if then you get to the thing about killing someone who's about to be a mass murderer. Well, in that case, if somebody's about, if you were there with Hitler and you were in a position to kill him in 1941 or, say, 40, and you would have came with a time machine and you knew what he would do, then killing him would be the greater good because you'd be saving all the deaths that he caused. And you really have to evaluate it when you're making decisions about what serves the greater good, or at least what doesn't hurt the greater good. And I believe that's crucial about freedom, that freedom is fine, and I believe in it, 
but only to the extent that you're not hurting others. I mean, rapists say, they're, well, I should be able to get what I want, shouldn't I? No, the other person is hurt more than you benefit, so that shouldn't be allowed. And I think that's the restriction in the end on freedom. Of course, I believe in freedom, but I didn't answer it before, but it's just to say you believe in freedom. I mean, people that do them are the most amoral, say they believe, I want to be free to do what I want. And what I want to do is steal from you, you know. I mean, you know, you can't you can't just go that people have freedom. Once people are evolved and they're in touch with universal love, well, then you mm. don't need any rules. People would know internally right. what was right. So does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it does. From that perspective, yeah, the human perspective of freedom. Yes, absolutely. The one that I dance with, the idea of freedom from the spiritual mind the thoughts that come to me about acceptance and inner peace. So it's not about fighting, trying too hard, forcing. So even though we see so much chaos, so much problems happening right now, especially now, there's something in me that comes from that freedom that says, be calm, you know, dwell in your own, this, own, this space that's yours, that's free. It's yours. So basically, is that I'm informed in a way that's a bit different. It is a Hindu, of course, understanding as well, that we are already free, that we are what we are looking for. We are already it. So in that sense, it feels so much lighter. It doesn't feel like I needed to carry the weight of the world and all the suffering. There's something about doing, doing something about it if I can, which I am doing that's something that's good for me and others. But there's, there's also that other part of me that says it comes from spiritual freedom, that this, it's okay for this to happen, for all this to happen. It's not, it's not about me. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, Ben, but this is what has been guiding me. It's my guiding principle. You know, being that I'm listening to you, <laughs> yeah. I thought this for the last 15 minutes, but I, I'm going to say it now even though it's difficult and we're all, we don't have any pictures, you remind me of a proper meditation lecture. It doesn't matter if you're teaching Buddhist meditation or transcendental meditation. But the real point of meditation is if you look at a screen, and it's hard to do this when we have nothing, no picture, but if you imagine a giant piece of paper and at the top level, that's our conscious thoughts. And then the next level, you got your subconscious thoughts. Then you got deeper thoughts like you're talking about. Then ultimately you get to the oneness where all thoughts are merged as one. And the point of meditation, which is really the point of all spiritual activity, is to allow your mind to get in tune deeper. And as you get deeper into the deeper areas, and you're conscious of it, or even super conscious of it, it can affect your behavior and your pattern of living. That's the point of meditation, I believe. And it's also the point of all spiritual practice, to be able to get in touch with these deeper, deeper rhythms, you know, which are really, you could say, divine, if you want, but they're within each of us and they're within the cosmos. They're everywhere. Mm, yeah. You just have to get in touch with them. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 again. <laughs> yes. So it, it goes back to that in, in a sense, to solve that problem. But I know you have, you worked before, right? You did a lot of work with World Peace and I do talk to people here that still, they are activists. They still fight for wor World Peace. But for some reason, they don't seem too peaceful to me, <laughs> some of them. And it, that's perhaps the contradiction, as you said, right? We are trying too hard to make peace, but we are not peace for ourselves. And that starts here. We cannot start there. It's here. And in conflict within. This might be a good time, Ben, to talk about the peace plan that you have. That's not new. My peace plan. Yes. yes we, we finally got <laughs> <Yes>. to that. <laughs> As I told you before this, I've worked on this book, not this book, but these ideas for 60 years. But in general, they're theoretical. But there's one thing that I went beyond theoretical with, which is 
When Security Council reform is discussed officially at the UN at a very high level, every government was, it was really Bill Clinton that started the discussion. That's another story. From 1992 to 2004, I had an organization whose purpose was to sort of upgrade the Security Council reform talks to empowering the Security Council to keep the peace when they really were only about adding new members to the Security Council. And VIPs from throughout the world loved my thinking. And because it was on the minds of governments and governments were sort of stalled in solving the problem, I met with a lot of VIPs from literally every country except North Korea. And using their feedback and added to some basic ideas I had, I came with a plan that experts from throughout the world said really was the most geopolitically logical plan to end war. Now, it never was proposed by a country for conflict. Well, the one of the truth, it wasn't proposed by other countries because everyone assumed the U.S. would never go along. And they were right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never met with Bill Clinton personally. I yeah. met with two people very close to him. And they agreed. Bill would have said, it's a brilliant idea, but the Republicans would shoot me if I proposed this. Even Russians and Chinese said to me, I don't know if our country would go along, but your country would never go along. Uh, wow. But now that Trump, for all the horrible things he did, I'll give him a compliment. He has shown the Republicans that they don't want to intervene in foreign affairs any more than the Democrats do. And they don't want to be the world policemen. So once the U.S. accepts that, Makes sense for us to accept a strong UN. Well, in the interim between when Security Council Forum Talks died in 2005 and 2000, and, and now, I was given two ideas. One I came up with on my own, and I'll save that in a second. But the more important one, I had been thinking about it. And the most important person in global affairs who ever met me and supported me was a guy named Romano Prodi. If you look him up in the encyclopedia, you'll see with the Prime Minister of Italy, but that's not why he, how he helped me. For a while, he was the head of the Council of Ministers of the EU. And he said, the way, and this was after Crimea, but before Brexit, he said, the way to get Russia to support your plan, or I, I don't know which one of us said it, but we talked about it, that you should do something, you suggest something that I proposed when I was the head of the Council of Ministers which is to create an area around the EU, like surrounding countries. Obviously, Russia could be one. The Ukraine could be one that would have the economic relationship with the EU without the political relationship. And then Brexit occurred. And Britain basically broke from the EU because they knew they benefited from the economic relationship. The Brits know this even more now that they've lost because of not being part of it economically, but they didn't like the political connection. And in terms of Russia and the Ukraine, the EU would never let Russia and probably not the Ukraine be full-fledged members because politically they're not, they don't fit in, but they do economically. So his suggestion was to then create an, a, a companion organization that countries would have They'd be part of the EU economically, but not politically. They wouldn't be involved in the super state stuff, movement of people, the other stuff. And in fact, when Brexit occurred before Theresa May said, we're going to use hard Brexit, I had a lot of supporters in Britain, both in Brussels, where they had still had members, and in London, and members throughout the EU who said it was a good idea, but then Brexit said no. How it relates to the current Ukraine thing is Putin's real complaint, which is, you know, Yeltsin had the exact same complaint. It's why he appointed Putin. And Gorbachev wrote, let, wrote articles in German papers with the same complaint that Russians felt when they voluntarily gave, ended the Cold War, which is true. They, Gorbachev agreed to kill the Warsaw Pact and let East Germany become part of Germany. And that was really the end of the Cold War. Gorbachev has written that he felt before he died that he was promised by George Bush Sr. and by Cole, who was then the Chancellor of Germany, that in return for him doing these things, 
we would get rid of NATO, we would count Russia to be part of Europe, we would treat them as part of Europe. And the truth is that never happened. The truth is that the Russians are correct, that we've expanded NATO and expanded the EU in a way that isolated Russia. And that was their fundamental campaign. And Putin said it was a fundamental campaign when he attacked Crimea and before he attacked the rest of the Ukraine. And so the solution is that if the EU did this and created this wider organization and let Russia and the Ukraine in, both Russia and the Ukraine would benefit, and that would motivate them to compromise over their problems. And also the British would want, want to join. And since France would be the only EU member that, well, the only one that has a veto, now I'll get to how it relates to the UN. France would get the capital in the organization. So Britain, France, and Russia would agree to weaken their veto, which is the key part of UN reform, weakening the veto or get rid of the veto. In return, for getting advantages from the EU. And then the US and China could get weighted voting. Because we would have more votes than anybody else since Britain, France, and Russia would be agreeing to get, in order to get a, um, in order to get special relations with the EU that are better for them. And the US and China would get weighted voting and that would weaken the veto. And, and in return, the five permanent members are weak in the veto. And then new members of the Security Council will provide troops so the UN could enforce its decisions. And that's the key part. Now, that's how it would solve the Ukraine war, how it resolved the Israeli situation. Sometime in 2009, I flew to Israel with an idea. And I'm Jewish. And I met with lots of Israeli Jews, but I also met with Palestinians, including in Rommel. I stayed in the Palestinian capital for three weeks. And unbeknownst to me, I actually met with someone from Hamas. Now, they knew I wasn't allowed to meet with someone from Hamas, an American. And they sort of tricked me into meeting him. That was the only meeting I had that they had blindfolded on me before I met the guy. But when I met him, he was friendly. And afterward, I was told that he thought my idea made sense. This is a Hamas leader. And all the PLO people up to Abbas love my idea. And in fact, after that, I went to the Arab League, and they loved it too. And the solution is the way to give Israel a security at once and give the Palestinians a state that they feel acceptable. Is it a three-state solution? Israel back to its 67 borders. And then there'd be a middle state ruled by the UN itself. And the UN Security Council would move to East Jerusalem from New York. And the UN would rule East Jerusalem and a section close to East Jerusalem in the West Bank, which Israel feels very important because it is settlements. And then the Palestinians would have the remainder of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And the way in which it would work, and it would be safer for Israel, since big countries that are adding as members of the council would provide troops, the element of troops stationed in its state, which is really a buffer zone in Israel and Gaza and the West Bank, to protect both sides from each other and around Gaza too. And that way, Israel could allow a state to emerge, but not worry that the state would attack them because there'd be 50,000 UN troops in the middle to protect Israel. Plus, nobody would want to attack the UN state because in the Middle East, everybody would like the prestige of the UN being there. And so, so my proposal, and no one's proposed this because it doesn't make sense unless there's a stronger UN first. Right. So mm. you combine my whole proposal, it would solve the Ukrainian issue, it would solve the Palestinian issue, and... And it would lead to fulfillment of the biblical prophecy that nations would beat their swords in the plowshares. Neither shall they learn the art of war anymore. Furthermore, it would help solve climate change. Because once we learn to cooperate to solve war, it becomes easier, particularly with the strength in the UN, to solve the problem of climate change, which is, after all, a global problem. And then once we do all those things, 
the healthy human race have a global consciousness, which getting back to what we talked about before, is what is needed to feel universal love, that you feel that someone in Pakistan is a human just like you. And so all these things come together with my peace plan. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. Although I understand very little about politics and, and everything that you just spoke of, I guess the question that comes to mind is, who needs to make that decision? Well, I'll tell you the answer. I know you're an American group, but if you have any French people, Really, the EU has to propose this to Russia. And I have a head of a Russian foreign policy think tank who believes Putin would say yes, but only if Germany and France proposed it because they really run the EU. And actually, one of the top French diplomats who's known me for years, literally the most experienced French diplomat near the top, has said the time might be right for mine. And he claimed that he's promoting it, among other important Frenchmen, I mean, I doubt that it'll happen because people have to believe, and even if he believes, getting other important people to... I mean, the key point gets back to what you said about fear and why I told you the story about heads of state I met. That when it comes down to it, that's why people don't compromise. Mm. I'm talking about nations. Yes. And, and national, not just my peace plan, just in general. Yes. They're so afraid of the other country. Yeah that both countries' mutual fear and mistrust mm. makes it difficult to compromise. Right. And so it gets back to what you and I were talking about in the beginning, that yeah. everybody, includes, including heads of state, <laughs> yes. have to become a little less fearful. Yes. And then all sorts of great ideas, not just my peace plan, lots mm. of other people with great ideas, mm. can come forward, which are looked at as overly idealistic now. Mm. Yes. And since my interviews run over, I hope you're yes. not going to forget to let me tell people how to buy my book. Oh, of course not. Of course not, Ben. Of course not. I, I mean, what's not to love about everything that you're proposing, how your mind works? Yeah. Thank you so much for being you. And I know you have been like this since you were very young. So you've been in touch with some powerful truth. Thank you so much for being open. And see, you're not, you're not fearful about that. <laughs> you're very open about the human experience and I am very beautiful. Open. But if I'm, since you give me all these comments of being <laughs> smart and brilliant, <laughs> I don't really see myself as better than anybody because of something Einstein said about genius. He said, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Edison said something very similar, Thomas Edison. That the only reason I've come up with the ideas and other people say you, you and I are clearly on a great wavelength. The only reason I've come up with some ideas you haven't is that I've spent 60 years on <laughs> Yes. I put 60 years of perspiration into these <laughs> ideas. <laughs> yes. I mean, even 15 years I'd go, my ideas weren't as advanced. They were similar, but not as advanced. You know, and 30 years, even mm. when I was in my 20s, mm. I had vaguely similar ideas but they weren't nearly what they are now. Mm. I mean, it's really just that I put time and energy into it, mm. which goes back to, on a personal level, mm. the value of meditation and spiritual growth. Right. You can't just think the idea that I'm going to become more loving and give up fear and more cooperative. You have to, like, live it. And living it, it's not just your behavior. That's the best thing, but that's the hardest thing to change. It's have a spiritual practice and which one's best for you may not be what's best for me, but you got to find the spiritual practice that speaks to you. And I believe in that more and more. When I was young, I didn't, I was totally, I come from a, an a religious background. Actually, there's a difference. My father was never would have seen himself as lightly religious. My mother was a hardcore atheist and it's as I got older that I connected what my heart and soul felt and what the Holy Books taught about the very remarks that you were reading over the back of my book, that I realized the political and the social are tied in with the spiritual. They're all connected. And it took me many years to do that. If you had met me when I was 30, I didn't even talk about religious stuff. then. I used to give speeches on cooperation, but I didn't talk about the religious and I just talked about the concrete advantages. But anyway, about ordering my book, yes. let's not forget that. <laughs> yes. 
the obvious place is order on Amazon and huh. different bookstores. But, yeah. you know, look up Becoming Angels in Paradise on Amazon. But where I'd rather you order it, and you'll get it quicker, is from my publisher, which is called Book Baby. And if you look up Book Baby Bookshop, then you plug in the name of my book. And if you have trouble doing that, go to Amazon. But if you're on a start, Barnes and Noble, other people have it too, but Amazon's really where everybody buys books these days. <laughs> so um, Amazon's sold a lot of books. One of the reasons I told you to go on my, um, my, um, my publisher's website, Book Baby Bookstore, is that I was just talking to them today and Amazon is giving me so many orders that it's backed up if you order at Amazon. Like I'm increasing my orders are going way up. That was not just word of mouth. I've, I've, I'm old and I have some money and I put a lot of money into advertising. Plus, you're about the sixth um, podcast or radio show I've been on. So, I mean, it's obviously because of the promoting I've done. But Amazon's actually backed up so many people ordering my book. But if you go to Book Babies, you can get it more quickly. Wonderful to know. And I'll have the link on your podcast profile. The podcast notes will have the Amazon and the bookbabybookstore.com as well. I'll take a look at there and have that clickable. Thank you so much again, Ben, for your presence in our reality and our shared reality and your beautiful, heartfelt and true to me ideas and concepts. And I, I love how clear you are, of course, and I love how humble you are too. Humility is part of that, of spirituality too, of that, of wisdom, really. So I, I see the, all those qualities in you. Can I end by making a compliment to you? Yes. <laughs> you know, you sent me a lot of emails about the stuff you you do, and I've heard you speak today, and we spoke a little before, and you seem like you're on a very good path, and a very you're a very meritorious, someone that can guide many people in a good direction. And I compliment you on that. And another thing that humility, which relates to what I said before and applies to you too, is just because, let's say, you are good at guiding people spiritually, that doesn't make you better. Somebody else may be better at being a carpenter. Mm. Somebody else, everybody has their own skills. Yes. And whatever skills we have, just do the best you can. Mm. And that's the most you can do. Yes. Yes. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Lovely speaking. To yeah. You. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. Take good care. Bye for now, Ben. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Benjamin Freeman and his work, please visit benjaminfreeman.carrd.co. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.